some of you may remember the throwing and the trimming of these pouring bowls, as I previously made a video showing that process. Now, a few months later, these pots have been glazed and fired, and so in this video, I'll be taking you through the entire process, from lumps of soft clay to the glaze fired, finished objects. These began as simple sketches drawn over a lunch break, very roughly and crudely, with the aim really of just getting a simple shape down that I liked. It can be remarkably difficult transferring something from paper into a physical three-dimensional object, but you can often draw out numerous ideas much quicker than you can throw them, so I find this a useful starting point. This will also be my first attempt at making pouring bowls for a long time, and like anything, it always takes about two to three iterations before landing on something that really works. And so in this video, I'll be making four different shapes, throwing, trimming, glazing, and firing them, and then we'll see how they pour at the end. That's the real test, and I'm sure I'm not going to get it 100% right. Anyway, that's enough foreshadowing. You'll have to wait until the end of the video to see how they perform. As always, this process begins by weighing out and wedging up a few lumps of soft stoneware clay. This process evens out the texture of the material and removes any air pockets that may lay inside them. Next, as I'll be throwing these on bats, I wet this pad of leather hard clay and the base of a bat. I place it onto the clay and then firmly push it down whilst wobbling it back and forth in place to friction weld it, sort of, onto the wheel. I then lightly dampen a patch of the MDF this way the clay really sticks in place, but be careful not to overdo it, as if the wooden bat is too wet, the lump of clay simply won't stick to it. What follows is the process of centering, which I won't go into much detail about in this video, as I've made a few that really break the procedure down, links to which you can find on screen now and in the description of this video. Essentially though, after the lump of clay has been forced to spin in the very centre of the wheel, the lump is opened up and the internal base of the bowl is formed, and I try to leave approximately four to five millimeters in the base itself. It isn't so much of a problem if you throw it thicker, as you can always turn away the excess material later on, but if you make it too thin and you don't notice it far enough in advance to fix it, then you may end up with a very thin, flimsy base, which, for numerous reasons, isn't ideal. With the base formed, I can begin to pull up the walls of the bowl, Initially I make a thick cylinder, which, after a point, I begin to stretch out into a more curvaceous bowl. If instead, I threw a cylinder with a very thin rim, then there'd be no way I could stretch it out without that rim splitting as it stretched, so leaving some heft in the lip is important if you're making bowls like this. The bowl is then gradually formed with slow, controlled movements, with enough water or slip so the spinning material doesn't stick to my hands. And once the shape is approximately where I want it, I'll begin to refine the outside shape of the bowl, removing a layer of slurry, slip, that coats it. And for most of the shaping, I hold the metal rib close to the profile I want, and then I push the clay from the inside out against it, as doing so imparts less pressure on the pot and makes the tidying up process of the shape safer, as the tool is less likely to catch, which could pull the pot off center and even destroy it. I then do roughly the same for the inside, although here my focus is on getting the curve right, and as I'm going to be pulling pouring spouts in the rims of these bowls, I make sure that they are really smooth, even, and slightly on the sharp side. I then use a dry index finger and thumb of my left hand to brace the wall, then I wet my right index finger and begin stretching this portion of the wall out, running the length of my finger up and down this channel, whilst being careful not to damage the delicate rim, as it's very easy for your nail to catch on the sharpest point of the pouring lip, tearing it. That's one of these bowls thrown, and now I'll be repeating this process three more times, creating a new shape with each attempt. If the shape of your spout isn't exactly how you want it, I recommend to leave it for the time being whilst the clay is still really soft, as trying to alter it or fix anything at this point will probably only make it worse, and instead I wait a couple of hours for the clay to stiffen up somewhat before making any adjustments. The first three have very slight differences between them in how the walls at the top conclude, whereas the fourth piece I made, which I can already tell is my favourite, has a more angular top which I think will make it more comfortable to hold and use, whilst also creating a groove the glaze will be able to interact nicely with. It's now been a few hours, and I'm going to make a few adjustments to my spouts, 
Typically I'll just smooth the underside if it's a bit sharp and then I pinch in either side of the spout just to give them a tighter, more pronounced shape. As naturally, spouts pulled like this will loosen as they dry, as thrown clay has a memory of sorts and will try and revert to being circular after being altered like this. I'll even very gently press the bowl back into a more circular shape if the spouting process did change it slightly. It's now the following morning and the first thing I do is wire these bowls off their bats so that I can flip them upside down as soon as possible. This way the base portion, which is usually a bit thicker and damper, is given enough time to properly dry out to leather hard. That's the state we call clay once it's dried out significantly and feels a bit like, well, leather, cold leather. And you should be able to pick these pots up, hold them and even squeeze them gently without them distorting. The bowls can then be placed upside down on the wheel, centered and secured with three lumps of soft clay and then the bottom can be trimmed, which for these shapes was really straightforward. I thinned out the lower section to give the pot a more narrow foot, as well as making it lighter overall. I do much of this refining with sharp tungsten carbide turning tools and once I've removed enough material with those, I'll scrape over and smooth the surface to get rid of the more prominent turning marks, whereupon I'll switch my attention to the foot itself, which I bevel on the outermost edge and then I burnish smooth the entire foot with the flat portion of a plastic kidney, not its edge. As this will be the only bare clay that remains after the pot has been glazed and fired, it needs to be finished to a high degree so it's in line with the style the rest of my pots have. If my pots were slightly wonky or irregular on purpose, I could get away with having some of that present in the foot itself, but as my pots are generally rather neat and strict, I feel as if my feet have to mimic that. If I have to trim the area the spout protrudes, this is how I do it. I work very slowly, pressing in firmly with the metal kidney, and I just lift the tool as the spout spins around. It isn't a perfect solution as it's slow going and easy to make a mistake but it works. This bowl had a thicker base, hence why I trimmed a footwell into it. And here are the finished four trimmed bowls, each with a slightly different shape, but they follow the same approximate rules of angularity and finesse. A few days later, now that these bowls have turned, completely bone dry, it's time to pack them into the electric kiln for a bisque firing to 1000 degrees celsius. The pots can be heaped into the kiln for this, as at this relatively low temperature the clay won't stick, so I try to squeeze in as much as I can to make each firing more cost effective. It's now 36 hours later and the kiln has cooled down enough for it to be unpacked. Clay has now turned into ceramic hardening and becoming porous, which is essential for the glazing process as it allows the body to draw in water, thus leaving a layer of the raw materials on the outside of the pot. And it's these that make up the glaze, the water being more of an agent of transport. And as I don't want the bottoms of these to be glazed, I brush a thin layer of wax emulsion over them, thus preventing the water from being absorbed into the body, meaning none of the raw materials can stick to the clay. You can actually glaze the bottoms of pots, but it requires firing them in a different way, as if I glaze the bottoms of these and then place them directly on the kiln shelf, the glaze would turn into molten glass during the firing, fusing the pot to the shelf. So you need to create a barrier between the two, separating them, such as wadding or some kiln stilts. Once waxed, the pouring bowls can be dunked into various different glazes, coloured red here by 1% red iron oxide, which will turn into pale green after being reduction fired. You can see the glaze peel off the wax. It doesn't do a perfect job and I'll still have to tidy up the basis of these with a wet sponge, but it makes that process of tidying the pots up after being glazed much faster. As for the wax emulsion itself, well, it just burns away during the firing and you'd never even know it was there. As for glazing these pots, they're dipped using a pair of tongs clasped tightly but not too tightly as these pots have relatively thin walls. If I were to squeeze too hard, the pots would easily shatter and break. The feldspathic crackle glaze dries quickly on these, but I keep the pot moving for a few moments after it's been taken out of the glaze. This helps it settle into a more even layer. The pouring bowls are then set aside 
and I'll let these dry out for a day or two so that all that water drawn into the body has time to evaporate. Once that's happened, the glaze turns from being quite tacky and difficult to alter to very powdery and soft, like you can see here. And it's at this stage that I fettle the surfaces clean and tidy up the base, sponging away droplets of glaze that have settled on the wax. And I'm very careful throughout this process about how I handle the pot, as the glaze at this point is just so fragile and delicate, and all it takes is one wrong movement to chip it away or to wear down a thin patch, which would ultimately show after the pot has been fired. I spend a moment smoothing over the lip just to make that pouring edge a touch more sharp so that it pours better. Whilst doing this, I work over a basin of water. This way, much of the glaze dust that's removed is caught, and eventually, I'll pour off the excess water and sieve this glaze back into the larger buckets you saw previously. Sieving is a must, as bits of wax and tiny fragments of sponge do find their way into this mixture, and it's no good adding debris like this back to the large bucket as they'll eventually find their way onto a pot, creating an uneven surface that you'll have to spend more time fixing. After enough pots have been glazed and tidied up, I can begin the process of packing my Rhoda KG340 gas kiln, which, just like the electric kiln, is packed as tightly as possible. Although in this instance, the pots cannot touch. As if they do, the glaze that coats them will melt and fuse together during the firing, and you'll have to snap the pieces apart, damaging both in the process. So I'm careful to leave about two or three millimeters between each. And I adore the process of packing kilns like this, as it honestly feels like one big puzzle, a game of Tetris where my aim is to fit in as much as I can. The following morning at 7 a.m. the kiln is lit, and once again I'll be rushing through this process a little bit, but I'll leave a link in the description that goes over the entire reduction firing process in much more excruciating detail. Put simply, this kiln is heated up very gradually to 1290 degrees Celsius, and at 860 degrees exactly, I initiate what's called the reduction atmosphere inside, which I do by sliding close the dampers that cover the kiln's flues and increasing the gas pressure dramatically. This creates an atmosphere inside where there's insufficient oxygen, as too much gas accumulates inside the chamber. And as a result, as the burning fuel seeks oxygen, it ends up taking it from inside the clay and glazes themselves, giving us colors and textures that you can't quite achieve with an electric kiln in the same way. And once the desired temperature has been hit, the kiln is switched off and allowed to cool down for two days. And once the pyrometer reads about 150 degrees, the door can be cracked open to allow the last of that stifling hot air out. The change is always dramatic. The pots have shrunk and changed colour, and those pots that were a pinky red are now a deep dark green like this. And here are two of those pouring bowls, the pots now encased in glass and much stronger, as the clay body is fully vitrified, which means it's no longer absorbent. This piece, with the indented rim section, is easily my favourite. It's more tactile, the clay is fired wonderfully, but the real test will be seeing how they pour. This version has upper walls that are straight, and is coated with a pale green glaze that contains 1% less iron oxide than the last but I do prefer the trimmed foot this one has. Here's the white pouring bowl, which has slightly underfired, meaning it didn't quite reach the correct temperature, hence the matte section this side of the pot has. I don't mind this piece, but I think I'll be firing it again to even the glaze out and to correct that cool spot. Lastly, here's the version where the walls flare out at the top. I like its shape, although frustratingly, I must have rubbed the glaze down too much in a few spots, leading to the thin patches you can see here. And with some initial tests, the best pouring one is the piece with the angular top, although with all of them, you need to pour carefully, as if you tip the bowl over too suddenly, the excess water spills over the side of the lip, causing it to pour terribly. But this one performs the best. The pale green one works well too, the lip is sharp enough that the water pours out neatly, and I think the shape of the wall underneath the spout plays a large role in how it pours, as this bowl, with a wall that slopes inward at the top, causes the water to sort of pull around the lip and pour down the side of the body of the bowl, especially in the moments you begin pouring and stop pouring. It seems to perform okay once the pour gets going, 
but it dribbles a bit too much for my liking, and I probably won't be making this shape again. And surprisingly, the pot I thought would perform the worst, with the indented top, creates the cleanest stream and seems to direct the water around the spout better. And these photographs I've taken should show off the shape better, especially the contrast between the orange rim where the iron clay breaks through versus the deep, dark green of the glaze. This is a shape I'll make more of. Thank you so much for taking your time to watch, and as always, I'll see you next time.